We're dealing now with the uh, source of the Quran from the, uh, from the Meccan period. See if I can find the Quran in this load here. Here it is. And uh, as far as the midterm goes, I think uh, we should do a midterm after we finish Surah 2. That's a lot of the stuff, and that would be maybe in maybe in two weeks or something like that. But I'll keep you informed about that, all right? And see what's, uh, when's a good time for everybody. But just start to think that we're getting somewhere close, and uh, we'll do it as soon as we find a convenient place. Now, as I was telling you before, uh, in terms of the Quran and its, uh, how scholars look at it, uh, uh, scholars divide it up into you know middle Meccan, late Meccan, and uh, and uh, early Meccan. What we've been doing now is the has been the uh, has been the um, Medinese period. And uh, I'm not so great at dividing up early Meccan, late Meccan. Uh, pardon me, what we've been doing now is the early Meccan period. And I'm not so good at uh, getting the middle Meccan, the late Meccan period, and the Medinese period after the flight. I mean, these are very specialized sorts of, uh, sorts of things. Uh, what I'd rather do is uh, go back to the... Uh, to the um, Surah of the Cow, Surah 2, which is the longest surah in the Quran and the most complete in terms of information, data, um, ideology. In fact, you could probably construct Islam on Surah 2. You probably wouldn't need the rest of the surahs at all of the Quran, except for a few things here and there that might add to something in Surah 2. But most of what Islam is, is in Surah 2, Surah the Cow, and most of that reflects what happened to him at Medina. Now, I told you that there was a flight, and I can't remember exactly where we left off, because it's been a few days, but the flight is known as the Hijra, and that is generally dated 622. But that is year, that is year zero of the Muslim calendar, or year one, zero to one is the first year. Let me turn off this phone unless I, someone calls me and uh, goodbye. Um, so that is really year zero. Now we also had some battles going on at Mecca that I was telling you about. After he goes there and 622 is the flight, he's followed by the people who take the flight with him. Hijra. What are the people who take the Hijra with him called? Emigrants, people who leave with him, go to uh, Medina from Mecca. Muhajirun, remember? I uh, put that on the board. If I put things on the board, you better believe that I'm going to uh, maybe ask you about them at some time. I don't put a lot on the board. On, on the board. Muhajirun. Here, H-J-R, H-J-R. That's how you build up Semitic languages on the basis of roots. Most words in Semitic languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, other languages of that kind, have three letter roots and the three letters mean something and then you play around with that root to get various meanings spinning off from that. Islam, as I told you, S-L-M, peace. <coughs> to make peace. Muslim, someone who makes peace. You add prefixes, you add suffixes for plurals, like English to some extent. You could probably say English is based on three letter roots, but it isn't. It's got, you know, sometimes two letters, sometimes five letters. You know, it's a totally different system, even though it spins off from words, essentially. German and European languages are more like English which is being based on a mixture of German and Latin. Uh, Germanic type words and Latin type words. So, uh, and a few other loan words like, um, let's see if I can think of one from Arabic. I'm not sure I can think of one. I think banana probably comes from Arabic or something like that. 
but uh, you know, some specific <coughs> nouns would come from other languages. Uh, we talk about Bader, we talk about Uhud, and the prophet was wounded at Uhud. What date will we give Uhud? Well, around 625, 626 maybe. I'm not completely sure of the dates here. Bader is uh, 624. I think one of the reasons for Bader was that he needed to uh, give the people in Hadjarun that came with him that were exiles and that put their whole life basically in his, uh, in his uh, confidence some, uh, some reward, some sustenance. What better way to get it than to raid the Meccan caravan? But on the other side of that, once he did that, there was no turning back. And once you raid your own people in Islam, you're really an outcast, and, uh, or rather Arab tribal, I'd rather not so much Islam. You're really an outcast. And, um, you know, like uh, Cain says in the Cain Abel in the Bible, my curse is worse than I can bear. Anyone who comes upon me can kill me. Why? Because he's killed someone in his own family and tribe, his brother, as it turns out. And why is he worried about anyone coming upon him can kill him when there's no one else in the world? Well, the Bible doesn't explain that, but the point is, it's an old tribal nomadic sort of fear. Without your tribe, you have no protection. So if you've, uh, if you've, uh, you know, been exiled, expelled, alienated yourself from your tribe, then you have no one to take what blood vengeance for you. So no, <laughs> and you, you are at the mercy. Just like in uh, inner cities, as I told you. Uh, some people in the gang world of inner cities, unfortunately, even in this country, where our authorities don't seem to be able to crack this problem, nor in the prisons, which is very sad commentary on our democracy, to my mind, can't protect its own citizens in some areas. You need the protection of a, of a, a group. So if you alienate yourself from that group, then What's the situation? Anyone who come upon you can kill you. So the point there is, uh, no one wants to alienate themselves from a group, which is why these uh, gang situations are so durable, because the people know you have no protection of them. 